Hello, I'm Marcia Kavanaugh. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, there are some issues that will never die, and the death penalty is one of them, as the state's attorney general raised complaints about the lack of implementation. Questions remained about the, uh, remain about the punishment's effectiveness. Elsewhere, there was new life as qualifying was held for fall elections, and a new head was named for the Sorge and Water Board. We'll look at these stories as well as a tragedy at the zoo, street gangs and car thefts, and the Zulu organization faces a royal controversy. Qualifying for us are tonight's informed sources. Errol Laborde, producer of informed sources. Stephanie Grace, columnist, the New Orleans advocate. Kurt Sprang, anchor, WGNO-TV Channel 26. And Mike Perlstein, investigative reporter, WWL-TV Channel 4. Over to Mike first. And we are going to talk about the death penalty right now because... It's in the news with uh, our Attorney General <laughs> Jeff Landry saying that he's pulling out of a lawsuit regarding the death penalty in the state of Louisiana because uh, he does not agree with the governor and not imposing the death penalty. Explain the whole situation yeah, to us. Yeah, it seems it's to be a bit of a manufactured issue. Actually, the governor's office and the Attorney General had been aligned in fighting a lawsuit against the state, which... Uh, took a issue with the state's use of a certain cocktail of drugs to administer the death penalty. Uh, the state was looking for options because some of the drugs in what the state had used was a three drug cocktail aren't being provided by the manufacturers in part because they don't want their name attached mm -hmm. to capital punishment. And the result is that there's a moratorium on the death penalty in Louisiana until the state can come up with some, you know, drug protocol. Well, uh, Landry is seeming to make or try to trying to score some political points by painting the governor as, you know, not taking a hard stand to re-implement the death penalty. The bottom line is the governor is on the side of defending this lawsuit, but agreed to this extension of the moratorium for another year until they can, uh, you know, ab abide by the law, the statute in Louisiana, as well as the protocol for administering this cocktail of drugs. So there's been a letter exchange between the attorney general <laughs> right. and the governor. Really a, right. But the mouth anything. I mean, you know. I the, mean, they haven't spoken about it. You know, this is one of the things the governor said is he read about this letter to him in the media. The media approached him, which tells you something. Um, there doesn't seem to be anything that really precipitated this policy-wise or, you know, in a legal step. It's, you know, the, what Jeff Landry said, I have heard that they are, they are carrying out executions in other states. What's the governor doing? What? I'm for the death penalty. I would, I'm for, what did he say? He had this really dramatic tweet oh, where he said, I'm for firing squad. firing squad, gas, lethal injection, whatever. Right. How about you, Governor? So it was really taunting him. So what does, explain and to the people, what does the law allow and what does it explicitly prohibit? No, there's only one method of uh, administering capital punishment, which is lethal injection. And there are privacy requirements, too, about where the drug comes from, right? right? And that's one of the other issues here that, you know, companies don't want to... Like you said, they don't want their names attached to That's it. That's right. It's, it's politically unpopular. Other in some states places. have had their legislatures uh, go to a one drug, um, you know, cocktail. Mm -hmm. uh, Louisiana has not done that. The legislature has not made a move on that. But the bottom line, to put this in perspective, the last execution in Louisiana was eight years ago, and then before that was 2002. So that's essentially two executions in the past 16 mm -hmm. years. So it's not exactly a, a pressing, you know, right. issue where there's some, you know, backlog of people ready and waiting for execution. And, but there are, there are many, people on death row. There are 72 row. on sure. uh, Louisiana and death row. And there have row. also been many exonerations of people on death row. So that's something right. else that is well, in that time, so in that time, people pause, yes. In that time of uh, 16 years, two people executed, there have been six exonerations from mm -hmm. death row. Mm -hmm. And this isn't on technicalities, these are people exonerated proven to right. be factually innocent. And then there are also revo reversals on, you know, error at trial. Those right. those have happened even more frequently. But the death penalty is there. It's on the books. For it's on the books. Yeah, the How effective have is the it? option? Do you know, any research mm -hmm. on that? I mean, I well, know there that's is. a big question. No, there is. And if you talk to death penalty opponents, they will show you that, you know, there are 31 states with the death penalty, but only a handful really regularly carry it out. Mm -hmm. Those states have some of the 
highest rates of violent crime and homicide. So if you wanted to look at that broad argument, does the death penalty provide a deterrent? It would seem to be just the opposite. The mm -hmm. states that have the death penalty have higher rates of homicide. And then one more note about the politics of it. You know, with the governor's very strong response to Jeff Landry, another letter, one of the things he said is, you know, you could have come to the legislature to try to change the law, and you never have. You, you know, you go on Twitter instead. Mm -hmm. And I mean, he has a point there. That is what happened. Is so. the governor for or against? Pretty quiet, mm -hmm. I have to say. The governor does not like to mix himself up in these issues. But you know, to say that this lawsuit, his stance on the lawsuit, means he is against the death penalty is not correct. So meanwhile, it's extended where no uh, implementation of the yes, death penalty. Yes, and this is a lawsuit in federal court, so that is a basically a federal moratorium mm -hmm. for another year. Well, the governor is a constituency that would tend to oppose the death penalty, except he has an electorate that would, that would exactly. favor it. So he's and, kind you of know, he's in very, that. he really sidesteps these hot social yeah. issues. I mean, that's just part of his success, frankly, in and the there state. there certainly might be, you know, his Catholic faith might also play mm -hmm. into his personal position, mm -hmm. but I don't think he's ever uh, opposed that the will of the state through the legislature is that we have capital punishment in Louisiana. All righty, yes. thanks a lot, Mike. And back over to you yes. now, Stephanie. We're going to talk about qualifying election yes. season here. Ended today. Okay. Um, it's interesting because there's so much political energy out there in the country right now over this midterm election, but not here. <laughs> I mean, we get to watch everybody else because a couple of reasons. One is we don't have a Senate race this year. Bill Cassidy and John Kennedy are not up, so you know that's when you really get the the big ideological contests and contests over control of the Senate. We have six House members. They're all running for re-election, and they're all in pretty safe seats. So um, they. Every one of them did attract at least one opponent, so they will be on the ballot. They will, you know, conduct campaigns to some extent, um, but none of them are expected to lose. And and one one to watch who's kind of interesting is um, a guy named Ralph Abraham, who's the congressman from the northeast part of the state. But his district, you know, kind of comes close to Baton Rouge and it goes into Washington Parish. So he he's thinking of running for governor next year against mm -hmm. John Bell Edwards. He's a Republican and what the fact that he has an opponent, what that enables him to do is something John Kennedy did when he was running for treasurer and he had a very easy race, but he still had a campaign to run, which meant he got to run TV ads and you know, the shape of Ralph Abraham's district means he can campaign for re election. Mm -hmm in the Baton Rouge TV market, in the New Orleans TV market, all over the states. So people will at least find out who he is. And then on election night, have impressive vote totals. Exactly, and, yes. And people say this is a real winner yeah. right, right here. So. And then we'll see if he actually goes goes ahead and runs against so John Bell Edwards. running against him is doing a really big favor. Yes, he is. Yes. <laughs> and, and Orleans Parish. Orleans Parish, um, you know, so there are a handful of races in different places. Um, Orleans Parish, probably the biggest one is clerk of Civil District Court, and that is to replace Dale Atkins, who has been in, was in that job for, I think, three decades. Mm -hmm. Never had an opponent, I believe. Um, she was just elevated to the appeals court. So um, the main challengers are, uh, the main contestants are Jared Brissett, who's on the city council, and a woman named Chelsea Richard Napoleon, who is um, the acting clerk, was um, Dale Atkins' first assistant. Um, from the trash hauling family, so there's some, you know, political money there. So they both have a lot of political support. So they're, that one's going to be very hard fought. And of course, if Brissett ends up winning, that creates, you know, the dominoes, the uh, vacancy on the council. Uh, there's first uh, first city court clerk uh, Austin Badon, the former state representative, is running. Timothy David Ray, who was a contestant in the District B council race last year. Um, you know, around the area, there are school board elections in different parishes, not Orleans, but Jefferson is always hard fought. You know, you have these real factions, and they're looking at maybe going for another millage to, you know, at some point to give teachers a pay raise. So that's that's going to be hard fought. Um, you have Secretary of State. Secre oh, of course, Secretary of State is the big one, and if, and that's not a regular. That's a special election because Tom Shuther had to step down um, due to sexual harassment allegations. Uh, one Democrat, uh, who's um, Renee Free, who's a and not a well-known person, but a, but a D, <laughs> so that gets you some votes, obviously. Um, she's worked in the AG's office and Secretary of State's office. Uh, State Rep. Julie Stokes, who thankfully is cancer-free, she was thinking of running for treasurer last year, and now she's running for Secretary of State, Republican from Kenner. Former State Senator A.G. Crow from St. Tammany Parish. Uh, a guy named Rick Edmonds, who's someone to watch from Baton Rouge. State Rep. Who is 
very involved in the Louisiana Family Forum, so he's got a real base of religious conservatives. And, and JP also a juvenile court uh, bench, yep. so a seat there. And various other judgeships. Mm -hmm. There is an appeals court judge in, yeah. in New Orleans, there's a civil district court judge, and you know, these are always when, you know, this is the musical chairs. Okay. Um, and then of course people are already jockeying for the big show, which is 2019. Right. Statewide legislature, parish councils, that's we're already there, basically. And, and governor. And, of course, governor, and The yes. governor's race. Okay, Steph, thanks a lot. We'll be hearing more about that in the yes. weeks to come, I'm sure. Okay, Kurt, there was an escape this weekend, which really got the attention of everybody. Especially people who live around the zoo. Yes. Absolutely. For sure. But, yeah, the, you know, the jaguar exhibit at the zoo, the Ottoman Zoo, is closed until further notice. Last Saturday morning at about 7.20, zoo workers noticed. Uh, well, initially we were told that that's when the jaguar escaped. <laughs> From its, from its habitat. But then come to find out that's when zoo workers heard either another animal or the jaguar itself making a ruckus outside of its habitat. That's when they discovered that the animal had escaped. They were able to sedate it and they've been keeping it in what they call a night house ever since then. But the animal attacked nine other animals, uh, alpaca, emu, uh, and foxes, uh -huh. and all of them either died that day or in the days after. And so it's been a very sad time at the zoo, and they've had, you know, frankly, they've had counselors come in to, to speak to the workers, and even uh, the, the, for the day, the zoo was closed on Saturday, but now they have to find out how this animal got out. They did. They believe that it was able, with its powerful jaws, mm -hmm. to bite a 8 to 10 inch hole in the steel netting at the top of its habitat, and that large cat, which is considered a big cat, got out that through, that eight, to, cat. Yeah, through that 8 to 10 inch hole and then went on what well, you would have to call a killing spree at the zoo. Which is, you know, the folks at the zoo and animal experts say, yeah, it's really sad, but he was doing what jaguars do. The quote is, and I wrote it down so mm -hmm. I didn't mess it up, but uh, nothing is going to happen to the jaguar. It was doing what jaguars do. That's Joel Hamilton, the vice, predator, uh, vice president and a general curator at the zoo. I'll well, say so the, uh, the zoo personnel certainly handled it efficiently though. I mean, it, 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 was, it was all done rather quickly. They made it very clear that they've practiced and that they have a protocol for just such an incident. And of course, you would hope that they would if they're gonna right. keep these kind of animals. They have, do, they practice it, and they, it went as planned. And what's the protocol if the zoo is open and there are people and there? I mean, you know, that's the terror, and, and that, that, even I more think terrifying. You know, there are so many things that people are starting to look at now. Yeah. Say, hey, this happened before the zoo opened, mm -hmm. thank goodness. Boy. This cat did not get out into the neighborhood because, I mean, I mean, how long would it, it could be there in seconds. It could get out of the zoo and cruise right. in, in seconds. So I think and there are a right number the, of issues the that the they're zoo, going to look yeah. at. They're also going to look at putting cameras in. Mm -hmm. You'd think they don't have cameras mm -hmm. in an exhibit like this, and, and it's not like the, you know, the cameras would have been a deal breaker money-wise. It's not an expensive thing to and have. it's kind of a new exhibit, isn't it? The it Jaguar they, Jungle, they raise money new. off They've of been, it. They, you know, yeah. talking it up and adding animals and, and, and all that. And so it, it was a tragic thing and an eye-opening thing as well mm -hmm. for all of us. And without the cameras, there's really no way of knowing when the animal made his break. Um, but he did make it all the way to the edge of the zoo. Right. And, know, that's and, where the foxes are. And, and exactly. And when you look at uh, yeah, the, the, all the animals that were attacked along the way, I mean, it, it, it meant business when it got out of there. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, it may be that these animals are less inclined, though, to make a move when there are people around. And so in terms of, like, during yeah. the day when there are people there, they probably know better. I mean, even in the wilds, they don't historically, uh, you know, attack humans. And so it's more likely they do it at night when there's nobody around. And, and right now they say that this mm -hmm. exhibit, they're going to look at the whole thing. And by the way, uh, the USDA has standards that this exhibit should meet, and they've exam examined it since then and said mm -hmm. it, it, it met all the met standards. standards yeah. And mm -hmm. so they're going to review, I think, not just that enclosure, I'm, I'm betting others as well, give them all a good once over, uh, and review this thing because, you know, they, they're going to they're they're have to put the animal back out. Or we wondered at the station, we put this on our Facebook page, we asked what should happen to the Jaguar, and I think people thought that we were asking if it should be euthanized, which is not exactly what we were asking but but you know would you say hey you know what this this jaguar maybe we switch it out with another one at another zoo or something mm -hmm. i don't know maybe maybe this one you know do people want to come see this one who knows well and also he's not going to be euthanized he's he not going to be euthanized and again nothing is going to happen to the jaguar direct quote 
All righty. Well, it was pretty scary and kind of kind of sad too. Yeah. And of course, the zoo is right in the middle of a residential neighborhood, and which is great. It's, it's such an asset. Zoo. It's such a yeah. wonderful asset mm -hmm. for this city. I mean, when do we ever go there for anything bad? We never go to the zoo for anything bad, yeah. but we did last Saturday. Okay. All mm -hmm. right, Kurt. Thanks a lot, Mike. New head, of the New Orleans Sewerage and Water Board. Yep. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, you know almost a year in the making with a series of interims and emergency directors, but a um, highly qualified engineer, the head of the Department of Public Works in Milwaukee, is, has accepted the job. His name is Gassan Corban. He um, seems to have the technical experience. He won out over the other finalist, Avis Russell, mm -hmm. who people may be familiar with the name. She served as city attorney um, under Mark Morial, and she brought maybe the administrative and legal experience, but in the end, the board and uh, ultimately, you know, selected by Mayor Cantrell, the choice was to go with the technical expertise, as the mayor put it, to have someone who could hit the ground running. Because we all know that the Surgeon Water Board has uh, a host of problems that they have to deal with immediately, not just on, you know, the drainage side, but as far as financing, as far as billing problems and resolving those billing problems. So there was obviously a lot of you know, questions about whether Mr. Corban knew exactly what he was wading into mm -hmm. here, not to mention uh, he's expected to start Labor Day or thereabouts, sort of the peak of hurricane season. So he may be having to deal with you know, rain events immediately upon arrival. So he's going to get a you know, pretty quick lesson on how he, this department operates. And you, you noted that he is an engineer and he comes from what, you know, Milwaukee, right? Milwaukee, right. But he has an extensive, I mean, he's been in the business for about 30 years, right? He has but, all in Milwaukee. He mm -hmm. went to Marquette both as undergraduate and his uh, master's degree in engineering, started as a you know, mid-level technical person within Milwaukee Department of Public Works and has just risen through the ranks there has taken on a variety of projects. The one thing that was touted as a, as a benefit to this particular candidate was the fact that in Milwaukee, he's the head of Department of Public Work, which includes streets, streets. as well as the water system, mm -hmm. which was <coughs> sort of the role that was played by the previous permanent director, Cedric Grant, mm -hmm. where he wore two hats, Department of Public Works over out of City Hall and director of Surgeon Water Board administered by, this, by the board. Uh, this candidate obviously has you know experience in both areas. It was kind of interesting doing the background on you know his history up in Milwaukee. For the most part, glowing you know reports, uh, well respected. He ran into one controversy when they had a I guess a unexpected dump of nine inches of snow in a very <laughs> short time. It looked like the direct equivalent of August 5th for us uh -huh. last year when we had that unexpected deluge of rain that flooded you know, streets, cars, and right. some houses. So he's also dealt with mm -hmm. you know, a crisis and had to go before right. you know, a council and answer questions. Why weren't those snow plows out there? Uh -huh. you know, well, we'll let him to answer that question it. anyway. Yeah. He won't need those here. Yes. He may no, have no, to answer other questions. Other questions. But you see, a good point, because it's, it's certainly different topography here right. than he's been dealing with, uh, and, and, and the, also the need to keep our streets dry right. to drain and us. And this, this idea of coordinating with Public Works has just been this elusive goal for so long mm -hmm. with the Sewage and Water Board and City Hall and Cedric, the idea of appointing Cedric Grant. Mm -hmm. And it was a good idea. It was a good idea. In it didn't theory, work. It didn't always, you know, So maybe this connect. will. I will say this. So, so talking to the rank and file at the Sewage and Water Board, they, for the most part, applauded this decision. Mm -hmm. They, It came as maybe a mild surprise that with the two choices, mm -hmm. they went with the one with the, you know, the technical background as an engineer. Well, we wish him luck. He's yes. got a long list of, the long to-do list, does Everyone he? wants him to do well. Okay, yes. okay. All right, thanks. Let's go over to, back over to Kurt right now. And you found out something interesting that, Car thefts are on the rise, particularly in one part. Well, <laughs> we've had a couple high-profile car thefts this week. We had the situation in Jefferson Parish where we had a car mm -hmm. full of young adults and even young teenagers uh, get in a car chase and get in a gunfight with deputies. Five arrests there. Then we had three arrests, uh, I believe it was in the Marigny, uh, for a car that was stolen. And the, there was some surveillance video of this car being stolen. It was pretty remarkable. Uh, the car had to be, you know, 
put it in drive and reverse multiple times to get around a pole, and the, the car got banged up in the process. And this was the surveillance camera from the uh, from the owners or the next door neighbor's house. But both cars were stolen out of Lakeview, and. So we started asking police a little, a little bit more and get it, to get some more information. And they say, well, car burglaries in the third district where Lakeview is are actually down this year, car burglaries. But car thefts are up almost 30%. And police believe it is in no, in no small part because people are buying the newer cars that have the keyless entry and oh. the keyless start. You push the button. And they leave that in a, that key fob mm -hmm. in a gym bag or in a cup holder mm. or leave it somewhere in the car so that when someone breaks into the car, all they have to do is just touch the handle and it unlocks. And then they can get in and go, oh, well, I can, I don't have to just burglarize this car. I can take the car. And so all of a sudden they're seeing what may have started as an attempt to what have been a burglary for a car mm -hmm. turns into an actual theft mm -hmm. of, the, of the vehicle. But they asked some of the people who um, some of the people who had been caught over the past few months, and they say they went to Lakeview to do this because that's where the cars are unlocked. That's Ooh, what they're telling. Warning. So, yes. so, so, so warning. Lakeview is apparently getting a bit of a reputation. Folks, lock your cars if you live in Lakeview. <laughs> well, and take that key the fob. Take the, the key the, fob inside. The joke is on the thieves because once they steal the car, the streets are so bad, <laughs> they have to get a flat right. tire. Yes. You know? right. They have to steal another one to get back home. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> but we've seen young people do this. And I mean, the incident this past week in Jefferson Parish, as young as 13 and 16, um, and I know this is something that you've been looking into also is, you know, groups of young ones out there committing crimes. It's part of an ongoing trend and, you know, we've seen it in every neighborhood and now at suburban parishes where younger and younger offenders, uh, you know, may start with jiggling, you know, the car door handle mm -hmm. uh, for a burglary, but who knows when you might come across a gun in a glove box, uh, you know, a fob left in a car where they can take, take off with the car. Once they're mobile, they can commit other crimes. So um, police are definitely dealing with this trend of younger and younger offenders, whether it be adult teenagers or juveniles 16 and under. Uh, it's on the rise seemingly you know, throughout city and parishes, uh, outside parishes. So is it worse in one parish more so than the other, would you say, or, or times of year? Like we're in the summer right now. We're oh, just the, seeing these incidents more because kids are out of school. The numbers, as they are with virtually all crimes, are higher in Orleans Parish, but uh, the suburban parishes are not immune. And so it is being looked at as more of a you know, sociological trend. Why are you know, younger and younger offenders taking these risks? Number one, the penalties in juvenile court clearly aren't going to be as steep. Mm -hmm. They're considered delinquents and not criminals. And that raises a whole host of issues mm -hmm. when it comes to how do you prosecute repeat juvenile offenders. Obviously, you know, Orleans Parish DA mm -hmm. Leon Canizero has taken some of the worst offenders, tried them as right. adults, which has gotten some pushback from the city council. So it does raise a host of issues. I think it's a, a trend, though, that it's not going to evaporate with the start of the school year. Yeah. It's been building for a couple of years, so it's not just a summer phenomenon. And it's something that, I mean, that certainly is an important part of the criminal justice system, the juvenile courts, you know, leading to Jefferson Parish. There's a, a seat uh, open in the Jefferson mm -hmm. Parish bench there, so pay attention to that. Yes. Okay, thanks a lot. Errol, Zulu is facing a problem right now. <laughs> yeah, um, it, it is. A, a man who was a, a past president, a man by the name of Naaman Stewart, who was past president, and he ran for the position of Zulu when he was elected, and he's facing charges of uh, sexual harassment. The Zulu, uh, the Zulu board suspended the man uh, as, from active duty as a, as a member. Still unclear whether or not he'll be able to uh, ride as Zulu. So that particular issue will uh, play itself out. I just wanted to comment, because all of this made me think about the position of Zulu King as just part of New Orleans culture. Mm -hmm. And of all, you know, New Orleans has many kings with all the carnival organizations. And of all the kings, being Zulu King, I guess next to maybe Rex or the celebrity who's the, um, uh, uh, the head of Bacchus, is probably the most high profile. And the only one who's really elected in a public election, that when they have their election, it's a big deal along Broad Street, you pass the by. The mayor made an endorsement this year. Along the Broad Street. Yeah. If you think all the people who elected 
to political offices, mm -hmm. next to maybe the mayor and the council and the legislature, the one in the Zulu King election may be the, the highest profile. Certainly, and they really campaign. I mean, yeah, it's, it's serious business. Certainly higher profile than some judgeships and, 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 and some clerk offices. And, and so it is very much part of the, the lore of New Orleans. And I think the, the ultimate testimony to that is Professor Longhair's song about going to the Mardi Gras. When mm -hmm. he talks about if you go to the Mardi Gras, somebody will take you to see the, to see the, the Zulu, Zulu King. King. And now he says St. Claude and Dumaine. He didn't go to St. Uh, Claude anymore. But... Um, but, but the Zulu organization, if you go along Broad Street, has really established its presence there. Uh, it has its clubhouse, and over the past few years, it's restored it, and they do a lot of work and a lot of activities there. And they do a lot of events. They have a huge, huge mm -hmm. uh, picnic in, uh, in, in City Park uh, every year. And it started off as what was called the Social Aid and Pleasure Society, as indeed a lot of organizations then. And it still holds true to the social aid and the pleasure part of it uh, mm -hmm. um, also. But it's... Um, Whatever happens, you know, somebody asked me if I thought that this would damage Zulu, and my answer is no. Okay? I mean, yeah. I mean uh, whether or not this man is King Zulu and Mardi Gras or somebody else, you know, it's still the king, and so it'll, and it'll Zulu, rain. Zulu so, has become so integrated with the political structure in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mark Morial is a member, all kinds of politicians. Uh, for the first time, we have a Zulu king on the city council, Jay Banks, who, right. you know, when he got to meet the king of Spain, he posted a picture of the king meets the king. and. Yeah, yeah, Zulu member in the city council, and, and, and so, and, and like I say, most other kings are selected secretly, or, mm -hmm. or uh, I mean, not anything sinister, but it's just the way they operate, and it's mm -hmm. not a big public thing, but Zulu so, is, is a public king. So this is something that the Zulu organization is dealing with now. All right, right. thanks a lot. Looking ahead. Oh, back over to you. Fifty years ago, there weren't any brown pelicans left in Louisiana. They'd all mm -hmm. been killed by DDD. This year is being celebrated by Wildlife and Fisheries as the beginning of the program where they imported pelicans from Florida. On the, uh, they brought them to an island, Barataria Bay, 50 years ago. And all the pelicans you see today are the product of that program that started 50 years ago. That island was a little bit uh, beat up by the oil spill, and they're trying to, uh, to rebuild that do and have even more pelicans. And they're such majestic birds. Mm -hmm. Um, we are less than two weeks away from July 31st and that, you know, we're approaching the height of hurricane season. It's also when the National Flood Insurance Program expires. Oh. Congress is now looking at extending it under its current terms. There's been so much talk of changing it. They're probably going to end up extending I mean, it through the end of hurricane it's a really season. Important. Fingers crossed. Yeah, fingers yes. crossed. Indeed. If you're going to go see the Blue Angels tomorrow morning in Biloxi, the police chief says get there between 5.30 and 7.30 in the morning if you want to watch from the beach. Always a great show. Mike. Mm -hmm. And back to Sturgeon Water Board, the board has uh, announced that they're going to start water cutoffs again starting mm -hmm. August 1st for unpaid bills that are no longer being disputed. So it'll be interesting to see just how many people's water mm -hmm. gets cut off. Water. Okay, guys, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you again next week for Informed Sources. Have a good evening.